It's become a bit of a joke. The US still doesn't have high-speed rail. A country that enjoyed some of the world's best railways a century ago has not a single bullet train. And the only one being built hasn't exactly gone well. But there's a new company trying to bring high-speed rail to the US in just a few years' time, and it might actually work. If that weren't surprising enough, the whole project got its start in... Orlando, Florida. This is the story of America's struggle to get high-speed rail up and running, and why this latest idea might just be its best chance yet. If you were to plan a trip between two major cities in the US, most Americans would tell you that there are only really two options. Get in your car and drive, even if that would take hours, or if the distance is simply too great, hop on a plane. Convincing people here to travel by rail instead is not an easy thing to do. Goddamn trains. Never can rely on them, huh? In some ways, you can't blame them. There's no denying the US is far behind the leaders of today when it comes to railways. But let's not forget this wasn't always the case. Its first railroads were built almost 200 years ago, and for more than a century afterwards, America had one of the most advanced and well-used networks in the world. But towards the middle of the 1900s, everything changed. Along came the jet age, allowing people to travel long distances across the country much faster. It's just a matter of boarding the plane and enjoying the trip. At the same time, Americans began their love affair with cars, and in the 1950s, the interstate highway system was born. Once the 60s came around, car travel had increased almost fourfold since the mid-40s, and there were nearly 15 times as many plane journeys. When the auto and the airplane sort of took off, a lot of the engineers that worked on railway shifted over or they retired and they were replaced by engineers who were studying aerospace. And so the talent pool also diminished. And yet, even though rail travel was in decline, the US still had big ideas for it. In 1965, after Japan launched the Shinkansen system, President Johnson planned an immediate response. I will ask for funds to study high-speed rail transportation between urban centers. We will begin with test projects between Washington and Boston. For over a decade, high-speed tests were carried out along the so-called Northeast Corridor, achieving speeds of over 150 miles an hour. By 1969, there were services running at speeds of up to 120 miles an hour, not that much slower than the ones in Japan. But in the half-century that's passed since, the gap has widened. Others have entered the race and have catapulted ahead. Right now, these are the fastest trains in the US, Amtrak's Acela line, which runs along that same northeast corridor. They can go as fast as 150 miles an hour, but only for a short distance. Compare that to the high-speed lines in China, France and Spain, capable of around 200 miles an hour, and there really is no contest. Okay, before we go any further, how fast does a train have to go before it can be considered high-speed? Well, although there's no official definition, the International Union of Railways considers 155 miles an hour to be the minimum requirement. Sorry Amtrak, your flagship service just misses out. But the US is trying to catch up. In December 2023, the Federal Railroad Administration announced over $8 billion in new funding for passenger rail projects, including high-speed rail. One of these is California High-Speed Rail, underway between LA and San Francisco, which has had more than its fair share of troubles. Eight years after construction began, less than half of it has been built, and none of it anywhere near the two main cities. As for the costs, we're now looking at more than $100 billion, and acquiring all the land has been a serious slog. If someone knows you need their land, and you've already sunk a bunch of money into your project and you've tendered a contract, you know, it's not incumbent upon the property owner to quickly satisfy your problem when they can hold out and get more money, especially when, you know, something like eminent domain is still a hot button issue in the US. Then you've got Texas Central, still going through early studies, and Cascadia, which has only just secured federal funding for the planning phase. 
neither is happening anytime soon. So is it just a case now of waiting for the California scheme to finally drag itself over the finish line whenever that may be? Well, not if this has anything to do with it. That's right, another plan has been put forward and it's making rapid progress. Now, before we get into the details, what does it take to be an engineer on something like a high-speed railway? Well, a strong track record of STEM subjects to begin with. But if these have a tendency to derail you, there's a new way to learn that's fun, easy, and free to start. Mechanical skills are essential for any railway engineer. And this week's video sponsor, Brilliance, has courses that easily break down complex concepts into quick lessons that are simple to follow and will get your cogs turning in no time. It's a great way to visualize problems and solutions, such as how to make big things like trains move very quickly. Take classical mechanics for example. With this course you'll learn all you need to know about matter in motion, from drones and locomotives to even skyscrapers. But if mechanics doesn't drive you, Brilliant has thousands of lessons on subject areas like coding and geometry, all of which are ideal for levelling up your career or setting yourself a new challenge. To get going, try a free 30-day offer by visiting brilliant.org forward slash the B1M or by clicking the link in the description. The first 200 people to sign up will receive a 20% discount off their annual subscription. Now, let's get back to that new high-speed rail plan. So, what is it that's so interesting about this new proposition? Well, first of all, the company behind it has just completed another railway that many doubted would happen. You are looking live at a historic moment here in Florida. I think today Brightline's first run from Miami to Orlando, it is ready to roll. Called Brightline, it links Orlando and Miami with the fastest trains outside the Northeast Corridor, capable of 125 miles an hour. It might not be high speed, but building any kind of new railway in the US has become very difficult. So how was this done? Well, one key reason is it's the first private funded rail line in the country for over a hundred years, costing six billion dollars. Instead of relying entirely on public funding, Brightline got backing from Wall Street to make these shiny new trains run. That includes work on more than 50 bridges, such as the one over the St. Lucie River, which is almost a century old. Challenging construction techniques were also required to build some of the new underpasses, like the box jacking method which was used to position these 3,000 tonne concrete sections under two roadways with the help of hydraulic jacks. And yet, most of the work involved upgrading what was already there. Much of it runs on tracks owned by the Florida East Coast Railway which has the same parent company as Brightline. For the completely new section between Coco and Orlando, Brightline made use of a state policy that allocates right of way next to highways for new rail lines. And they decided that, okay, they, when they were bought by a Wall Street firm, that they wanted to do passenger rail. And so they decided to use that right, their right of way to do that. If you're a private operator and you think, okay, there's sort of an underused freight rail line that I can buy. and convert to passenger and it makes sense that that's you know good for you that's smart okay but what about that new high-speed rail plan well the company has now set its sights on a far more ambitious project right on the opposite side of the country called brightline west it's a new 12 billion dollar high-speed railway between las vegas and southern california connecting all the way to los angeles According to Brightline, it'll be America's first true high-speed railway, with top speeds of at least 186 miles an hour. That's quite a bold claim when construction hasn't even started yet. However, there are plans to begin very soon and to complete by mid-2028, in time for the Olympics. The 218-mile or 350-kilometer line will run from a station right on the Las Vegas Strip to Rancho Cucamonga, just over 40 miles east of LA. Passengers can then jump onto a Metrolink train and get to Union Station in around an hour. In total, a journey between the cities will take approximately three hours, down from about five hours by road. 
Driving also means having to travel on I-15, a highway notorious for congestion. And yet it does carve a nice straight line through the high deserts of San Bernardino County, which is why 96% of the new train route will be aligned with I-15, much of it running between the two roadways. Again, Brightline has been able to secure a critical right of way alongside existing infrastructure, this time signing a lease agreement with the California Department of Transportation. You know, they're putting most of their right of way in the median of a highway. That minimizes some of the environmental impact. Obviously, the land acquisition issues become less hairy. So I think there are lessons to learn from Brightline. Another similarity with the Florida project is that this won't be relying just on public funds. Private bonds and capital will cover most of the costs, with only $3.75 billion needed from the government, most of which has now been confirmed. Three billion coming our way to make Brightline a bright new reality for our tourist corridor. That's all in stark contrast to California high-speed rail, which so far has relied entirely on government funding. Brightline West has already received a $25 million grant to help with design and construction. That was awarded back in June 2023, and the project has bipartisan support from officials in both states. But it's not all going to be an easy journey. Aside from the funding gap that still needs to be filled, there's one part of the route that's likely to be especially challenging, the Cajon Pass. Situated between the San Bernardino and San Gabriel mountain ranges, the pass presents steep grades, even for freight trains. High-speed trains really have to travel on ground that's as flat as possible, so they need to slow down through this key section. Even so, Brightline West is looking like it could be a safe bet to complete before its troubled neighbour. I think there's a high likelihood, based on the estimates on California high-speed rail, that they, you know, Brightline West probably could get something built before California high-speed rail is connecting, certainly, Los Angeles and San Francisco. America's inability to build high-speed rail is a long-running saga, and many have simply accepted it will never happen. But having achieved something down in Florida that took many by surprise, Brightline is convinced it can do the same on the other side of the country, this time going a big step further. Will it break down without leaving the station? Or is this American dream finally becoming a reality? This video was sponsored by Brilliant. You can join them with a special offer at the link below. There's also the chance to dive deeper on this and other topics on our channel over on the World's Best Construction Podcast, available right now wherever you get your podcasts. And as always, if you enjoyed this video and you want to get more from the definitive video channel for construction, make sure you're subscribed to the B1M.